Welcome to an episode of In the Know. I'm here with my co-host Mason Ginsburg. Again, we have a very special guest guest today, Keith Smith of SpotTrack. He is an amazing cap analyst. He also covers the NBA. You may see, see him um, making people angry when he tweets about the Celtics or Magic or literally any other team. But this is Keith, and we're glad to have him. Keith, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, you must be on uh, cloud nine now that the Celtics have. Uh, punch their way to the finals. What's that? What's this, what's this like playoffs uh, been like for you? Just kind of watching them. Yeah, it's been, it feels like a little bit of uh, it's all coming together finally after years for this core, the, the, this core group was together for, for a while. You know, really it, it's kind of funny. I think back to 2018, they made game seven of the East finals against the Cavs and LeBron. And it late in that game, Tatum threw down a dunk on LeBron then hit a step back three, and I was like, holy cow, this team without Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward is going to go to the finals and play the Warriors. And it didn't happen because LeBron is LeBron and doesn't let things like that happen usually. Um, but four years later, they they did it with Tatum and Brown and Smart and Horford and you know, then then the right pieces around them, and it finally all came together and it feels it feels, it feels kind of like a relief. It feels, you know, fun, like amazing. I don't know. All of it uh, wrapped, uh, wrapped up together in a ball. I I feel like, so Keith and I talk a lot about the Yankees. And we're not going to talk about promise you, We're not going to talk about that. But um, I am because uh, you being, <laughs> growing up, uh, you know, my, my, my dad's from New York, big New York sports fan. So I grew up hitting all Boston sports. And so I, I was rooting for Miami in this, but I got to say a warrior Celtics finals feels like the worst case scenario for Lakers fans. And that's like a saving grace for me, I think. Yeah. I like that part of it too. I'm, I'm enjoying that. My, my co host over on the front office show, Trevor Lane is a huge Lakers guy. Uh, he's been covering the team forever. He's been a Lakers fan. So we're, we're a mismatched pair with that, but it's uh <laughs> Yeah, he's, uh, you know, it's funny. I like to tease him. Uh, well, of course you're rooting for the Warriors because all Lakers fans are Warriors fans when the Lakers aren't good. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. I was going to make that joke if, if you did. <laughs> I guess the Clippers would be worse, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, seems, it seems not good. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of incredible to, to watch how, um, you know, midseason a team can transition from, bring where they were just kind of like, I guess, treading water, uh, so to speak. And then now becoming an absolute elite defense with two young players who are uh, just, I guess, blossoming into their games and, you know, taking the, the next step very before, uh, like right before our eyes. I think the biggest thing was like, to me, is like their, their, their ball movement that, that increased from the beginning of the season, the way they swung the ball around, especially in the, the buck series and the way they were finding open shooters and not being afraid to shoot. I mean, Grant, Grant Williams shot how many threes? Was 18, 19? That, that, uh, <laughs> that, that 18, game? yeah. 18, I mean, ridiculous. But, like, that's that's the level of trust they have in their teammates now, I think, which is um, has been instilled by by their, by their head coach, first-time head coach, Emi Adoka, which, again, I think it's interesting to watch that, you know, previously we had Steve Kerr and David Black go to the finals as first-time head coaches, and now we have Emi Adoka. And, and it kind of, like, goes to show that you can find coaches from, like, different, like, backgrounds whether they've been assistant coaches in the past with Steve Kerr he was the the GM and, and David Blatt was what, international and, and just I guess there's no trying to two recipe for success other than having very good players <laughs> yeah I, I I feel like you know I go all the way back to his introductory press conference he uh, took a shot at Brad Stevens like two seats away from him and said you know 27th and assist Brad come on you know, and he basically <laughs> said, we're going to move and share the ball. Like, like, you know, and then he, he expanded upon that as things went along. Of you know, The stars need to know it's going to come back to you, but give it up, make the right play. You're still going to have the ball when it matters. You're still going to be the guys. And and that really has all come together here in this playoff run, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah. I feel yeah. like we're setting up for, for, I, I don't know, like what I, I get before we maybe move on to the Pelicans. I mean, what's the, the long-term Eastern Conference outlook now in your opinion? Because it feels to me like it's now it's going to be Giannis versus the Celtics. And, like, I don't really see another tier right now with what's going on in Brooklyn, which I'm sure is just every Boston fan's elated about what's happening with the Brooklyn Nets right now. But um, And then, you know, Miami, I, I don't know. Like, you saw how – I mean, they fought. But I, I just – I don't see any other team right now on a tier with Milwaukee and Boston. It doesn't feel like that's bound to change anytime soon. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely some truth to that. I think there are – 
the the East is better than it has been depth wise in, in years. There's a lot of good teams now instead of being kind of four or five. You feel kind of good about, but but yeah, I think those two are the best teams. I you know personal opinion, I think Giannis is the best player in the league. Um, that doesn't mean I think he should have been the MVP, but I you know we know that's not necessary how that always goes. Um, but yeah, I, his teams are always going to be good, even if it's just simply because of him. But they've also got other really good players too. Um, I think Boston set up for this to sustain and last. Miami, we'll see. I, I I don't really know fully what to make of them because I think they they I could see them right back again next year, but I could also see it all kind of going sideways. But I think they're one of the best teams in the league. Uh, organizationally, when it starts to go sideways, they adjust and didn't step out of that and move on to whatever is next. I, I think that's a you know, mindset that has served them well. And then the other team, I'll just throw out there to keep an eye on, Toronto. I think Toronto's got a chance to really be pretty good here again very quickly. Um, I, I don't want to be insulting to Brooklyn or Philly, but got to, you know, let, let's see where things stop when those circus rides stop spinning. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I think it, it's nice to be able to kind of talk about the Celtics here because if you look at the kind of the trajectory the Pelicans are taking, I think one of the teams they're hoping to emulate in terms of a rebuild model is the Celtics. The Celtics outsourced um, a lot of their tanking to the Nets, and they they bet against their future, and, and it paid off in big ways. And they were selecting high in the lottery, you know, top three picks while they were making conference final appearances. And now the Pelicans quite – Aren't, not, aren't at that level yet, but they're coming off a playoff appearance. They have a top 10 pick that they're they're waiting to add. Um, so I'm just curious about what you make of the the steps that the Pelicans front office has taken just over the past year. And and we can talk about the, the years past too, where they kind of fought, uh, stumbled and, and tried to find their footing uh, when after they drafted Zion. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of an important one to go back to when they, they got Zion. I thought the AD trade was a home run. For the Pelicans, no full full stop. I you know didn't you know fine. The Lakers, you can say, did great in the trade too. They won a title. That's that's what matters in the end. I have no problem with that, but that doesn't diminish at all what the Pelicans got in that trade and will continue to get. We're going to see that keep paying off for for a little bit here down the line for sure. I think their one mistake was then it was oh, we got Zion. We, we moved up. We got the pick where we're, we're going to get Zion. Then it was, let's fast track this thing. Let's go get all these guys and let's, let, let's, let's push this in. And, and that felt a little off to me um, as far as, wow, I, is this really the way? And I mean, maybe it would have worked out. I don't know. They had all the injuries and all the issues there. And then uh, two seasons ago, right? Yeah. Two seasons ago, we, we saw, you know, Zion, just how special he can be. Um, you know, I, I look at that it was such a dominant season. It was, it was almost like casually dominant, I guess, because people didn't really right. talk about it. This, the, the, like, like the numbers he put up at that point in his career were insane, and people were just like, "Man, okay." Like, I, I didn't get it. That part never made sense to me. And then I thought this year, I thought Brandon Ingram really made big steps forward. I thought what I liked most from him was he consistently became the guy versus sometimes he was the guy. And, and I think that kind of goes parallel to like Jason Tatum's approach of you can always get yours, but can you get yours while getting other guys involved too and make plays? And I thought we saw a lot of that out of Ingram this year. Now that there are other moves that they made, I mean, CJ McCollum, I knew he was good for the Pelicans. I didn't realize how good he was until I really got into things and broke it down. You guys know how the season goes. You you can't keep track of all 30 teams the way you know you want to. So it became you got to let some of them go. And I was like, all right, they're playing good. I I knew he was doing pretty good. But one once I really started di diving into that uh um you know his numbers and the way he played and everything, unbelievable. So now I think they're really set up well for, you know, it's probably going to be kind of a boring off season, I think for them, but I think that's okay. You've already done all the other stuff. Now it's about continuity and consistency and building that going into the year. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, um, you know, I, I, I like a couple of things, but both of y'all said, I, I love the, the outsourcing your tanking comment about Boston. I think that's a really clever way to put it. Um, and, and I, I know. So, so Keith, where, I mean, do, do you think there's one single biggest priority for the Pelicans this this offseason? And it could be something that 
um, you know, may not, they may not need to, you know, it may not impact next season. It may impact longer term than that. But is there, is there one thing besides like obviously like nailing the draft pick that they're getting from the Lakers? Is there one thing that you would be focused on more than anything if it, uh, if they were them? I feel like it's an easy answer to this, but I didn't know if you had other, 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 uh, other thoughts in, in your mind. Yeah. I think the easy answer is Zion's extension, right? <laughs> but aside from that, I think hitting the summer with the team, at least mostly healthy, is huge because I think you you see and you consistently hear about the especially the teams that are on the come up as they're getting better. You hear about them regularly say it was that time when we're in the gym together in the summertime. And that's when it came together. That's when we started to figure things out. And, and it's funny because sometimes I think, OK, that's probably true. But but if you've got seven really good players and like a bunch of guys who are all replacement level. What are the really good players getting of <laughs> probably dominating the replacement level guys? I think with the Pelicans, the cool thing for them is they're like 10, 11, 12 guys deep and guys who can actually play. So whatever summer workouts you get, and you're not going to get all 12 guys, right? Because guys are going to be doing stuff. And uh, like, like I think Valanchunas is probably playing for Lithuania this offseason, um, I would assume. Um, you know, so you'll have stuff like that going on. So you're going to have things where guys are going to be in and out. But as long as you can hit, you know, late August, early September, ahead of training camp opening with the guys in the gym together. That's huge because that's where you start building things moving forward. And I think that'll be really important for them going into next year because that's how you kind of hit the ground running and avoid. I know there was injuries involved, but that start, you you, you just can't have anything like that again and hope to be a real uh, serious contender because it's just too big of a hole to dig yourself out of. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's funny you mentioned uh, the summer workouts and stuff. And I think that's an area where having CJ McCollum, having that veteran voice, just like holding all the teammates accountable. But not only just that, he's been there. He's been in the league for what, like 11 years now, 12 years, something like that. I don't know. I'm just making a number up here. But for, for a period of time, and and he's, he's worked with Damian Lillard, and he's done this process every single offseason. And I think the Pelicans have played um, – I guess, musical chairs with who's going to be the adult in the room over the past few off seasons, whether it was JJ Redick or Derek Favors or Drew Holiday before that, um, Steven Adams even, and, and God forbid, Eric Bledsoe. But uh, <laughs> I think now they've, they've, they've found, they've found the right one. And, and I think that's going to go a long way. And uh, they, you know, they're already saying how they're going to meet up in Vegas for summer league and everyone's going to be there. So I hope, I hope that influence carries over to someone like Zion and and they're all, you know, working together. Cause so you're right. Those, those, those moments matter a lot moving, moving forward, but. Sorry, if you... I can one quick thing on the summer league thing too. Yeah. Um, we see it every year, right? Because we see they pan to, to, to the sideline and there's, you know, five key guys from, from the team that are there watching, you know, maybe two guys who might make the team or something like that. Um, play playing summer league. What gets missed out of that is, that's what they're doing for two hours during the summer league game earlier in the day. Guaranteed those guys were together, working out together, doing their stuff, getting their work in. Like that's what gets missed. It's summer league is we, we focus on what's going on on the court, but when the veteran guys show up, they've been working somewhere in a gym, somewhere in the Vegas area. And a lot of times it's almost these informal team workouts that happen. And those are just huge because that's how you build that chemistry and that bond uh, moving into the year. So yeah, it's where, like you said, those guys talking about it now in May, that's huge because that means you're committed to it. Cause if you talk about it and then don't do it, everybody's going to throw that back. And I think what you said about CJ being there, CJ's not going to let you talk about it and not do it. He's going to come at you and let you know, hey, man, you talked about it. Like, you got to follow through. Absolutely. And I think and – that, and that's a great point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And I think um, since, since we've already – Broach the issue a little bit. Might as well tackle it now before we get into the other stuff. Let's let's talk about let's talk about the Zion extension. Um, there's been interesting reporting going on. I think Brian Windhorst most recently went on air saying um, this is coming from ownership, according to Brian Windhorst, that the Pelicans were not going to offer him the fully guaranteed five year max, and they're going to structure it in what he called as a football contract, um, which I think is just you know layman's term for heavily protected, non guaranteed. Uh, things like that. So I guess first things first, should the Pelicans take this opportunity to 
try to secure a deal that is injury pr protected or are already or are they risking too much already bringing that to the table when you have a guy like Zion and and you you know you worry that he potentially might leave yeah I think you start like anything you start with do you need the full max the answer is most likely going to be yes so from there then you make your negotiating point all right well Here's how we we get there, right? It's we, we can do this, but we need something on your side. I almost uh, approve it. I I know they 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 termed it a deal you know, NFL style deal. We already had it, right? Just call it what it is. It's the Joel Embiid max, right? Where he had to prove he could stay healthy and stay on the court. And that's what what I think. I think that's the approach you should take. And if I was Zion's camp, I, I get it. You don't want that, right? You want. Give me five years, fully guaranteed. Give me the player option on the end. That's the best I can get out of this. But I think you have to understand that's probably not best for, for the, the, the Pelicans. I think, you know, there's got to be some give and take here. I Where I ultimately landed is, you know, maybe what you do is in the middle and you say, all right, we're going to do these non-guarantees, but we'll still give you the player option too. Because then you get something, we get something out of it. We're all kind of protected and we move forward from this because I think that's where I, I wouldn't mess around too much because I don't want to lose the player, but I also don't, it, it's weird right now. It feels like we're not hearing that buzz around Zion as much anymore. At least I'm not seeing and hearing that it seems to be more other teams that would like to have Zion are still saying those things. And I think this is now turning into I, I'm going to guess you you kind of challenge the guy and the guy looks at it and says, all right, I'll show you like, I'll, I'll get there. I'll, I'll get that money. And, and, you, and you just build it off like that. They'll build it a lot like the way Embiid's did where if the knee or the foot goes again, then we have to have a conversation. And that doesn't mean that it's even going to end up there. Cause you only, the only way you recoup that money is if you actually wave the guy and that's even still that becomes very hard to see unless it becomes all right he's, he's missed another whole year and he can't stay on the court for more than a month at a time but you know that's you deal with that when it comes yeah so I, I think an important distinction and i feel like a lot of people hear the joel Embiid contract and don't actually know what that means beyond injury protections right and i think one thing you brought up was it's about pre-existing injuries so it's not like if zion misses the season because he breaks his you know you know, breaks his wrist or something or or, or tears his tears a labrum you know that's not going to be part of that like that's just you kind of like bad luck right we're talking about injuries in this joel and b contract the what, what the sixers protected themselves from was injuries to air parts of his body that he already had issues with and so even with that i think there's probably some wiggle room and like, i feel like the one key area of the pelicans to be concerned is his foot and so I, I know he had the first injury was his, his knee, I believe. But they don't have to like bake it into any sort of injury protection, so they don't want to. So I feel like there's also some gray area and some give and take mm -hmm. on what they protect too. Um, that said, I think the bigger issue and a lot of the, what, we, what we've seen with Zion is it comes down to optics, right? And I don't know how much, to your point, um, and and this probably leads in nicely to um, some of Schmidt's ideas around the contract structure. But I don't know if Zion's camp is going to be is going to be thrilled about just having that you know that optically look like he's not a player you can trust to be healthy even if that's been historically the case so i think that's going to be an interesting part of this too yeah so i think with, with regards to some of the contract structures my before we get into that the one thing i want to say is how much of a, of a risk should the pelicans be willing to take in terms of hey if zion doesn't meet you halfway or he doesn't you know agree with any of your proposals he wants to add into restricted free agency. Is that a gamble the Pelicans should take? One, um, with with Zion's qualifying offer being what it is, if he, you know, if he's a if he becomes a starter level player, if he hits those minutes, he hits the criteria, then that's going to be around seventeen million. If he doesn't, you know, it's going to be around seven million, which is I think a meaningful difference in terms of the options that he may have, or I guess the leverage he might have. Um, but the other thing is, is is should the Pelicans chance the fact that okay, Zion can go secure an offer sheet from somewhere else? And then they have to match this, but the offer sheet's full of, of things that are annoying, right? So like the upfront money, the trade kicker, the the three plus one player option. Um, is And is that something Zion's camp should sign knowing that the Pelicans can also bake in like Rose Rule, Rose Rule escalators on their side to help him reach an even greater contract total? Yeah, I, I, so is there risk? Sure. 
that's where the relationship side comes in so heavily because you have to have faith and trust in are we in this together or not? And if you start thinking it all like, yeah, this maybe isn't going to be the way this is going to go, then, then you have to treat things a little bit differently. And I think, you know, right, wrong or indifferent, they more think wrong than anything else personally, but we know how it works in the NBA guys take, they sign the contract and it's as good as signed for whatever restrictions are on it trade wise. After that, they don't want to be somewhere. They're going to ask for a trade or they're going to flat out quit on teams, not play. I mean, and I'm not, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying Zion's going to do any of these things, but we just know how it goes in the NBA. And it's something that'll to some level be addressed in the next CBA negotiations. We'll see what that looks like because obviously teams are going to want protected against those kind of things. But I, I tend to think the same is true though, right on the other way of if guys are not performing, Teams will trade them instantly and not even think twice. So I kind of don't have a huge issue with the players protecting themselves. But that's a whole aside, not even really answering your question. So I think what you have to really think about with, with this is, one is, he's not going to sign the qualifying offer in restricted free agency unless he absolutely hates everything about you know the state of Louisiana and maybe the entire southeastern United States. Like, he's just not going to. Did we lose you, Keith? Are you still on, Mason? I can't hear anybody. Hold on. I'm on mute, but yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, I think we lost Keith. Yeah. Um, That's cool. We can wait. Um, But in the meantime, uh, yeah, man, I think the contract's going to be a pretty interesting negotiation because I think they have to secure five years. in some way, shape, or fashion. Oh, hey, we got Keith back. Hey, sorry about that. We've got a little bit of weather rolling in here, so I don't know if that's what's affecting things. Um, Totally understand. (laughs) So I don't know where it cut out, but what I was going to say is he's not going to sign the the qualifying offer. It's too much money just in one year's salary, unless he's miserable there. Do you sign an offer sheet? Yeah, maybe. We've seen that happen, right? We, we see sometimes guys do that, and then they use that. I, I just I tend to think, to, to your last point you threw in there, the Pelicans can put some other stuff in that no one else can do. Rose rule, designated player. They can do all sorts of stuff. And it's not crazy to think that Zion could make the designated player markers if he stays healthy, because that's how good he was, uh, you know, just two years ago. I mean, and I have no reason to believe that his talent level has fallen off. So as long as he stays healthy, this guy could make all NBA, could be an all-star and could hit hit all those markers you need to make to to be there. So I, 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 I tend to think that's why it's more likely to me. He'll sign with the Pelicans one form or fashion or another, whether it's protections or not, and that'll be where this plays out. But but wouldn't that mean that they can't make Herb Jones their designated player? <laughs> uh, you can have two. I had to get that in. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's. I think that that's an important distinction because they didn't make Brandon uh, the designated player. I think they couldn't at that point either because they didn't give him the rookie extension, and so or. No, wrong? they could have because they traded for him while he was still on his uh, rookie scale contract. Right, so but what I mean is that they let him go out to the end of his contract. Yeah, right? you like, could have given him the designate. You can do the designated money. It doesn't have to always be an extension. It can be on the okay. back end, but at that point, he was already on a max deal. He hadn't yeah. qualified for anything, so it wouldn't have mattered anyway. For sure. But I think what, what's important is that you allow yourself that flexibility with Zion, and then that leaves the door open to trade for one, um, and you're not you're not shooting yourself in the foot um, because that's kind of what happened with the Kyrie Irving and Anthony Davis situation is they both had that contract language in in their contracts and the, the Celtics couldn't trade for Anthony Davis during the trade deadline and we all know how that went. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that yeah, I mean that that would have been interesting. I mean, I think we can go down the what if, but I think. Um, I guess as we're talking about it, the, the idea was if, if Davis came, then Durant would come too. And and I think that was the the end game there with, with Boston. And that would have been very, very interesting to see see how that played out. But um, as we've seen with the Nets, it may may not have worked at all. 
<laughs> um, anyway, sort of sort of going back to to Zion, uh, we've talked about specific um, protections with they, regards to. I feel like AD and Ben Simmons shoot about the same from three, so maybe it would have been exactly the same situation as Ooh. in Brooklyn. Ooh, <laughs> sorry. <That's okay>. <laughs> um, but you know, going back to specific injury protections, uh, I know you know we, we talked about specific ones like his foot, so they can in- include what they call the Exhibit Three injury um, exception, and which is like a clause in the uniform player contract that allows them to tie it to a specific injury. Um, but Keith, they they also have the flexibility to sort of guarantee portions of his contract almost based on anything, right? They could they could tie it to games played, they could tie it to minutes, they could even tie it to performance incentives, right? Yeah, yeah. You performance incentives get a little harder just because those those trend into um bonus and incentive language. But it generally these things are tied to games played and minutes played threshold. So um so that's usually where, where you'll go and it's usually based off the prior season. Um and then you have to, to guarantee the money and how how like if, if we use him beat as kind of the, the, the comp, how his looked was his was a full max deal just the last few years of it were non guaranteed. Um, because the sent if if he had a recurrence of for Embiid, it was foot and back injuries. Um, if he had a recurrence of either, the the six, 76ers could get out of his contract with minimal uh money owed uh to him. It was a little sliding um each year on that, and then that is um you know, kind of a, a, a thing we could see come again. Again, the key is, though, you have to waive the guy to, to then get it. And if you waive him, you get nothing out of it at all, right? You get yeah, some savings. So that turns into more of, you know, Zion rebreaks the foot and it's like he's, it, it comes out, he's never going to be the same. Then, then you move on. And at that point, doesn't matter whether you're waving them or you have them as dead it's become a disaster situation anyway right so you you're you're just you know salvaging the best you can out of it um it did the general though with like Embiid, Embiid has had other injuries since um you know a bunch of them but he never had a recurrence of the foot or the back thing so he's had back soreness but that's i mean that's every big man in the NBA at some point. So I I wouldn't feel too nervous about locking in on those things because a lot of these injuries seem like they don't come back up um, for, for some of these guys. And and I know people make the, you know, which pains me as a Bay fellow big boy, but make the jokes about him being fat and all that stuff. That's not, I mean, stop with that. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, those things, you know, stuff happens. I mean, skinny guys get hurt too. You know, there's no just stuff happens. So those yeah. things I don't, I don't, you know, see. And I tend to think if yeah, if you had some protections in there, then maybe he is a little more motivated to do what he needs to do to stay in shape and those kind of things. More for the knee, I think, than the foot. I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about the foot, but the knee. Um, just right. If if you're carrying a little extra, it's going to be a little harder to you know keep that pounding off your knees. But yeah, I, I'm. This one is going to be so fascinating. To watch play out because it's it's we haven't seen anything like this with a top overall pick ever. The closest comp I could come up with was Markel Fultz, and we're we're talking two completely different players uh, as far as ability goes. Yeah, I think the the point you bring up about you have to wave to get any kind of benefit out of it is super super key because I think. NBA contracts can be guaranteed for a, a variety of purposes. One, either you're trying to bake in cap, cap flexibility or you're trying to bake in cost control at some point. You know, we saw with Josh Hart's super unique contract that I think the Pelicans wanted to, to have flexibility first and foremost, and that also made him a tradable contract. I think with Zion, the objective very clearly is we are happy to give you all the money in the world if you're on the floor. We're not trying to, you know, squeeze in cap, uh, like cap room like two years into your contract. That's very much not the objective with him. The objective is like, we want you on the court and we're happy to pay you to be on the court, but that's what we need protection from. And and I think that's what people got to understand is, is that's that's the direction what that contract's going to look like. There's not going to be any kind of like, oh, well, we just don't want you, so we're going to waive you and create cap space. Like that. that's just not going <laughs> to, that's not going to happen. If, that, um, if that's the case, <laughs> fire everybody, <laughs> shoot them all off into the sun because that's, you know, that, and nobody should be involved with running uh, a basketball team if, if that ever happened. So, yeah. Shimeda, I wanted to ask you because uh, you, you brought up in the, in the past 
um, the, the hedge on this could actually be the opposite direction and saying, we'll guarantee you all the money, even the fifth year, but you're not getting an option. So similar to what the Brandon Ingram contract looked like. And so um, it sounds like based on what we've heard recently from the win, uh, from Windhorse report, doesn't seem like a, an avenue or, I mean, uh, whoever Wendy got it from, but doesn't seem like as, as of right now, that's an avenue the Pelicans are so hot about. But do you think that's still on the table? Uh, could be an option. Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. I think I think like if you approach the table with that as your baseline, then the Zion's camp is gonna be like, all right, no, we want the option, right? Then then yeah. you're then you're then they're gonna be like, no, okay, well if you're giving us that, we'll take the offer sheet, we'll do a three plus one, and you yeah, and that's a starting year. point. I hear. Um, yeah, and sure. so so I think I think what to what Keith said earlier, like you gotta like approach the table with with something stronger uh, that protects you, and then then you work to find a middle ground somewhere, and maybe that, that ends up being the middle ground where it's like, all right, well, you know, we, you got the fifth year fully guaranteed, you don't get an option, and maybe there's some you know like protection baked in it on you, and it's not as much as you you hope for. But I was you know when when Keith cut off for a little bit, I was saying I think I want them to find find a way to get that fifth year in the first place because. I think the more years you have on that deal that you have control over give you leverage in a Ben Simmons type situation. And, you know, like just, just one of those things where someone demands a trade and you're not quite ready to trade that person unless the deal is, is what you want it to be. Just the more, more years you have on that, um, the more pressure you can apply. Cause if a guy is just a year away from his option, then you're like, you don't have much room to, to, to play around with cause that asset's right. going to depreciate pretty, pretty quickly. Yep. Um, but speaking of, of, of extensions, there is uh, there are a couple uh, other candidates. There's three candidates, actually. But uh, the, the most important one, I think, out of those is CJ McCollum. CJ is going to be extension eligible um, in uh, August, I believe. And then I just wanted to get Keith's thoughts on where where he feels about you know what he feels about extending a guy that is CJ's age um uh on this team and then you know what what that would sort of look like if you're kind of looking into the idea that the roster is about to get very very expensive if if yeah. you are going to secure zion to a long-term deal yeah i think with cj you have to be really careful right because he's 31 or will be 31 at the start of next season he's got two years left 33 and 35 million roughly uh for him on his contract so one you're not looking at that kind of money um you know, you're, you're not bumping him up. I can't imagine, you know, going into what would be his what, year 34 season. Uh, that That's just, it's, I love CJ McCollum, but you, you need to be Chris Paul level of good to feel that comfortable uh, with that. Um, he's also a guy, he's had a couple injury things um, in the course of his, his career too. So you want to be, be cautious on that as you build it out. So I think it's very um, important that you, Try to get this done. I don't know you need to get it done this year, though, right? It doesn't need to be right now. We still got two years left. I would almost take the let's wait and see approach. Let's let's go one more year. We can tack it on after you know one more year. Similar to kind of what kind of ish what they did with Valanciunas. I know they did that before seeing him play, but they did it with one year left. Um, that I think makes sense just because of where he's at in his career. Um, because the last thing you want to do is to your point. You got Ingram, you got Zion. Those are going to be two major, big, hefty contracts. I don't want to be adding another one that then becomes, how am I going to work around this one a little bit? Um, you know, but my guess is, you know, one more year and then you're probably maybe able, because then too, you can add more years. You could give them three versus two. Um, it still takes them out the same length, but but you could give them three, three years on that because you can do up to, you know, adding years on. So I, I would look at it that way and say, you know, Hey, can we do something here where this is what we're looking to do a little bit less money, but we're going to give you more long-term security knowing eh, it might be kind of bad in that last year, but final year expiring contract, we've all seen it. We're going to see it again with Russell Westbrook and John Wall. You can work around those that that can, can be done. Yeah. There, you, there's... Just to clarify, sorry, Mason, just want to clarify for the listeners. Yeah. Um, when there is an extension, does it extend upon the extension year or the option year that CJ has, or does that option go away and then the years are tacked on to, to that? It would go well. It did, does he have an option? I thought he had an option at the end. Oh, I think it's straight. Think it's oh, but then, okay, well, disregard. I thought he had an option. Um, that that final year. Um, but now, now okay, you yeah, got go me wondering, it. so I'm gonna check. <laughs> 
This is this exactly. is why we have spot rack. Yeah, right. That's exactly where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't think it is. I I, I, I want to say no. Um but anyway, just to, I can answer your question while I look it up. It is um it, it is if you go into it, it is um it, you can do it one of two ways. You could either decline that option um and then do it without the option year in there, or you could opt into that option and add it. All that matters is all, and all that changes there is how many years you can add on to the, to the end. Um, whether you're, you're adding one or two years onto the end or you decline it or, you know, get, get that option year out and then you do it that way. And we've seen guys do it all different ways in the past. Some guys have opted in and then taken years. Some guys have opted out and taken years. I, I, I think there's two, uh, based on what you said, Keith, there's, there's one thing that I think is, is important to consider. And, and the you, you mentioned the amount of years you can add on to an extension. And, and in a weird way, the Pelicans, by looking to do something this summer, could be protecting them from themselves in, in a way. If you can only add two more years versus three, that's, you know, you're, you're not extending out even deeper into uh, CJ's 30s. Um, obviously, you're probably going to pay a little bit of a premium to do that. Um, but but something to consider, and I'm sure something that would cross the Pelicans' minds based on when they you know broached that that subject. Um, I think also, and one thing big picture, I did want to make sure we got your take on before the end of this podcast was the the pending salary cap increase, uh, you know, coming from the new media deal, and so um, not just as it relates to CJ in general, but you know anything you any anything you know or anything you. Um, you know, you've researched about, you know, what you expect uh, come 2025. I mean, are we going to, you know, gradually get into that, that new cap environment with the media deal? You know, what do you, what are you expecting? Even if you think about the Celtics, the magic or the rest of the league. Yeah. I, I think the NBA, meaning the team side of the NBA wants to avoid another spike. If they can, they would rather gradually price in the increase. And I think part of, coming out of the bubble season, part of their agreement of we'll, we'll artificially bake in a minimum 3% bump every year, even if it's not real, we'll still raise the cap 3%, was maybe setting the table for down the line, we want to artificially the other way, hold it down a little bit. I think I, I fully understood why the Players Association said no when we had the prior cap spike. Because why would you trust these guys? That, you know, right? I would say, no way. Like, I'm not going to trust you to spend it. Then I think when they saw Timofey Mozgov and Luol Deng and a whole <laughs> bunch of other dudes get massive deals, and then a whole bunch of guys for like two years not be able to get paid, they realize, actually, all this spike does is help anybody who's a free agent in that one year. So I think now we're going to see them find middle ground, and we'll see some gradual step up. But – it's a lot of money sounds like is coming because live sports are the one thing that still, still draws a ton of money. So I think we're going to see this come to a major, major jump, but it'll gradually get built up, but it's still going to be, you know, kind of the, the thought process of a rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody's going to see, see it rise up now where that'll the teams that'll be really helped are the ones kind of where you're, I think, going with the Pelicans. But you've already got guys locked in for big money. You're going to be helped because that they're already locked in. Their cap numbers won't change. Right. I think this is one of the major misconceptions people have because they get the concept now that a max salary is tied to the cap. It's only tied to the cap into the year it goes goes into effect. After that, that's it. Oops, I'm yep. banging my mic. I'm getting excited. We're getting deep into cap stuff. So I'm getting fired. <laughs> um, that's why we have you. Um, <laughs> it's it's really important to understand. Once it's locked in, it's locked in, and that's it. It doesn't go up. So now, what you've done is you've created that gap in between. That's how you all of a sudden have guys who, man, that guy's max deal now looks like a great deal. Because because we've seen the cap go up so much. Yeah, it, I, and I think that's important to keep this in mind when you're looking at future negotiations too. Because you know Zion's agent, you know CJ's agent, they're all going to say that. They're all going to be, you know, oh, even yeah. if you give this guy a, a, the most money you can right now, it's going to look great in a couple of years. And so yeah. I, I think that's a key negotiation tactic that's going to be deployed that maybe isn't, uh, you know, clearly visible at start. And that could be why we see CJ may, they may even want to, he's not going to be a max guy 
clearly at that point in his career. Um, but they may even want to hold off just a little bit on signing an extension and say, hey, versus locking in, you know, maybe we want to wait and see. Maybe there will be more money, you know, for him going out there. We're seeing smaller guards be good later and later into their career all the time now. Um, just with the you know dif- different things guys do to take care of themselves and the things teams do to take care of players too. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, and then you kind of touched on it, like the influx of money that's coming, the gambling money. I think that's going to be something to watch out for. Also, shout out, shout out DraftKings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to work that that in there uh, for a little bit, but you know, I think with with CJ specifically, and and you and Mason have both touched on this. It's the, the years, I think, that are, are probably more dicey than, than the, the dollar amount, so to speak, yeah. because, uh, you know, you could probably do bigger money if it's only for two years and just, you know, you'll, you'll like like you brought up with Russ and, and John Wall, that final year is not uh, a tremendous obstacle if you don't want it to be, especially with the draft assets that the Pelicans have um, lined up because the Lakers, you know, just don't have that kind of capital to, to kind of play with. Um, but sort of moving on uh, and, and zooming out a little bit with the, with the Pelicans, uh, they're what about 2.4 million projected to be from underneath the tax, um, given 14 roster spots, and that includes the the eighth pick or the hold for the eighth pick. They don't have that would means they don't have the ability to use the the non taxpayer um, MLE in any significant way. They could use the taxpayer MLE if they wanted to, but um, I doubt this team is willing to go into the tax at this juncture. Uh, when you look at the roster spots and kind of the players uh, the Pelicans have, and you talked about this maybe a little bit of a quiet offseason, do you do you feel like there's any kind of pressing need to gain more breathing room under underneath that tax line um, and maybe try to move off a guy like, uh, let's say it's Devontae Graham, or maybe it's, it's even Garrett Temple and, and his $5 million or whatnot, so they can perhaps bring in someone else? Or do you feel like, hey, this is still a wait and see, there's no, there's no rush here, they have you know, their core rotation locked, um, just kind of collect data at this point. I'm still holding out hope for that for that uh, Garrett Temple buyout and assistant coach hiring for for a, for a number that's almost exactly the same as his salary this year. It's coming. No oh, man, that'd be. I would love to see how that that one goes goes. Cap circumvention at its finest. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that would be amazing. Um, and then 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 he retires from coaching when they need somebody on a ten day and you know slides back in as a player. Um, yeah, I. So a couple of things. One, I think. Devontae Graham, obviously, that's a it's a juicy number sitting there trade wise, right? It's that mid range contract you kind of need to have to to get something done. I think the the thing I think about with Devontae Graham is, I think he was miscast early in the year. They they needed too much out of him that he's that's not what he is. Um, I think he is your classic sixth man score shooting scoring player. I'm um, off your bench. I think now he set up. Uh, better to do that than he has been at any other time because I think he can can pass and he can be a playmaker but he really works better with other passers and playmakers so I think when you have guys like like Ingram and Zion and McCollum you I mean McCollum and him is together in the back where that's a little problematic defensively but you but putting them on the floor with two of those guys or even all three of those guys I think you look a lot better um, I'm a big, big Devontae Graham fan. I, I I really think he can play, and I think it was just it was a little miscast. But alone, that's probably the best piece of salary matching they have, aside from Temple. And maybe the idea is you put the two of them together at some point and go get something you need. But I think that's a let it go into the season. Let it play out and see what you got. You're, you're 10, 11, 12 guys deep and guys that can play. Um, I would not be in any form of rush to go and do something big right now and i mean clearly if something great comes your way you act on it because you don't know that it'll be there um but I, i'm not pushing to make moves just to make moves the roster is i mean got the only free agent on the entire team that's not a two-way player is tony snell um and you quite frankly you need that roster spot for draft picks so it's going to be gone i mean i think you're looking at a team that is fairly well set roster wise for now. I also, the last thing I want to do is bring in anybody who's going to take minutes away from the younger guys. I want to see, obviously Herb Jones needs, needs to, and will play, right? He's that's, that's what's locked in, but I want Trey Murphy to play. I mean, we saw what he can do as far as loosening up the floor with his shooting. Um, I, 
I still think there might be something there in Jackson Hayes. I, I'm not I'm not as quite as enthused as I once was with him, but I still there's still something there, still something worth exploring that studio space with. Um, Jose Alvarado has to play now. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of guys on this roster that you're gonna go, and that we didn't even touch on a guy like Kira Lewis. Um, when he gets back from his injury, you, you want to make sure you have minutes for him. I think whoever they draft at eight, probably it's like <laughs> I hope they like Birmingham because you're probably spending a lot of time there, <laughs> um, just the way the roster is built. But that's okay, right? That's that's good. That they, They're well positioned to take literally whoever the best player they think is going to be yeah. in the draft. Not who that player is today, because that guy's not probably going to get minutes. It's whoever you think is going to be the best player when you pick at eight. So, you know, lock, yeah, I, I just – I know it's not fun, right, because fun is trades and signings and all that kind of stuff. Let the season tell you what you need as it goes, whether that be performance or injury wise. Yeah, you had, you had Schmidt looking like uh, Mr. Burns over there when you were talking about your uh, let the let the young guys get minutes because that's exactly <laughs> what you've been preaching. Yeah, I mean that's 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 what we've been asking for all season, especially with with Trey, uh, who, who took a little while to break into the rotation um, on, on a on a bigger capacity. But you you, you brought up the eighth pick and and you mentioned you know they're they're in a position to take the best player who they. Think is or is going to be the best player in the future. Um, would that be your preferred philosophy with this eighth pick? A lot of people have kind of uh, floated a couple of different things, whether to use eight and then the conjunction of your movable salary with, you know, whether it's Devontae Jackson, Grant, uh, Temple or whatever, um, to, to go get maybe an impact vet or to use eight to move off of Devontae and trade back into the draft a little bit um, maybe and then maybe draft someone that's more ready. Uh, I, I know I feel very strongly about a certain philosophy, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on on what they should be looking to do with that. Yeah, I tend to think when you're super close, like, for example, I'm not trying purposely to take this back to the Celtics, but them trading a pick to go get Derek White, at that point you felt like we're really close, go do it. That's the time to do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't care about another kid who's – 19, 20 years old developing at the end of my bench and in the G League right now. Go when you're close, go do it. I don't think they're that quite that close. I think they can be really, really good. And maybe if we get into the season and it's proven, hey, you know what, we're we're kind of there, then go go make that move. But I think what you need to do with the pick right now is I would pick the, like I said, the the, the, the guy who I think is going to be the best player, whether that's two, three, four years from now, that's the player I'm going to go after. Um, trade back and add a guy who's maybe a little bit more ready right now. My question would be, where, who's, who, how ready is that player going to be to beat somebody outside who's already there? I, I, just, I, I, can't, I just can't Thank see you. that. Right? I just, you know, yeah, maybe if you were picking in the top five, maybe then you could could say – one of those top five guys is going to break in. I just don't know. I mean, I don't even know you're getting that guy at eight necessarily. Certainly don't think if you drop back into the mid teens, they are getting that. And then I also would ask too, what else are you adding? If you're going to drop back there um, to, to well, what, what's the other capital? You get more future picks. Cause at some point you run out of roster spots. That's we're kind of seeing that play out right now. So when you run out of roster spots and then having a million draft picks, this is why I think you two guys know this. I'm not super high on Oklahoma City. Um, it's really important that they they moved up into this top three because I don't know that they're having a million draft picks is great. Like I because they don't look like they're all going to be all that good. Then what are you going to do? And you run out of roster spots. You know what? The other 29 teams know it too. So they they don't they're not interested in your oh hey we're going to give you four first round picks to move up five spots. Why? So then I have your problem two years from now. <laughs> I don't really care about that. So that's not, I mean, this isn't the Thunder podcast. I can do that with those guys later. But it's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sold on doing a whole lot with that draft pick except take the, the player you think can, will be the best guy at some point in the future. Love that. Love that. Cosign completely. That's that's where <laughs> I've been at the, the whole time, actually. I feel like it's just such a rare opportunity to add a top 10 pick. Uh, to a playoff team, and and you you have to be thinking long term, and I think the draft is like a eight to ten year decision, and and you know if all goes well, you're going to have that person in your organization for eight to ten years, and and that's that's exactly the mindset that you need to be taking. 
they take it from me when the Celtics are in that position. There were legit Celtics fans who are like, we already drafted this Brown kid who looks pretty good. We have Jay Crowder, and we feel really good that we're going to sign Gordon Hayward. Why are we drafting another forward in Jason Tatum? Think of how that <laughs> would look today, right? Like, that's just, I mean. That, that was, I'm fact, assuming, a lot of the people who wanted faults at that time. People wanted faults. Yeah, people wanted faults, or there were even some people like take Lonzo. There were people who thought, oh you know, gosh, you, yeah. You know, part of that, I think, was about Snake and the Lakers, too. Sure. If there's a, you know, I did one of my favorite things is if there's any one thing uh, Celtics and Pelicans Twitter can agree on, it's, it's, uh, you know, let's, let's do everything we can to keep the Lakers down. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, you know, it's just funny now to think back on those conversations where it was like, we, we really needed another forward. And it's like, it's not, it's not about that. I mean, and Jason Tatum obviously developed quicker than I think even they thought he would, but it's still just go, go get the best player. It'll all sort itself out. It's the NBA too. Things change so much in a two, three year window. You know, don't, don't worry about it. Just go get the guy you think, yeah. think will be good. Yeah. yeah. So it's not even just the Lakers though, too. Now I, I feel weird because obviously like we stand for Drew Holiday in this podcast, but at the same time, um, the Pelicans picks are the Lakers one. There, there we go. Lakers one and the Bucks. And so, I mean, if the Celtics were to just completely demoralize the Bucks as they continue to ascend <laughs> here, and to the degree that Giannis is, is, gets so frustrated, like that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for the Pelicans. Even though, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not about tearing down other small markets that are thriving like Milwaukee. So I don't. The only reason they want to see that is for the Pelicans' draft picks in the future. But it's, it's weird. Yeah, the Celtics, this, our, the Pelicans' interests are weirdly aligned to I think what Celtics fans are looking for too. <laughs> Yeah, hey, we. I, I always say too. There, there's, there's things I want to see strictly out of selfishness. You know, I, I, I wanted the Nets, <laughs> exactly. the Kings, and the Grizzlies to be the worst teams in the league, uh, certain years, and there were there were years the Nets helped with that. The Kings and Grizzlies, uh, you know, they didn't. They, they two of their best seasons that they've well until now with the Grizzlies, of course. But uh, those two teams, they, they, they didn't follow through in that part of the bargain. That's another reason too why. You know, Ben on the draft can be it's such a tricky proposition. You you got you got to be really you got to make the right moves around that, and I and I think that's what's you know key key. And when you do get the guys, you got to do what you can to keep them. Completely agree. I think I don't have any more Pelicans related questions. So I wanted to ask you about general league league wide things heading into the summer. There's I think a couple a few different interesting storylines. Uh, we can start right in your division um, with with the Sixers and and Harden and everything. Do you feel like Maury is at a point where he can offer Harden all of that money that he wants, or where, where do you feel like they're headed and in, in the trajectory of their team? Yeah, you can't give them the full five-year max. That'd be insanity. That's just throwing money away five years from now because nothing James Harden throughout the entirety of his career has shown me he will be even a good player five years from now. I, I don't even think we'll, we'll be there. But when Harden, whether it's – he hasn't said it directly – um, but it's there's enough stuff coming out that it's clear he's made it clear. I don't necessarily need the full five year max deal. I think what you're going to see is they're going to land. If it's something like three or four years, it'll be less than max money, or it'll be two or three years at the max. And then I think you're okay. I, I think think you're probably then protected enough. Uh, that's where it's going to go. I think that's where uh, Maury's going to have to lean on Harden a little bit to say, hey. You know, you know, I got you. Like you're my guy. I went out and traded you know everything I could to get you. Um, you know, we're, we we need you here. And then I think Harden will come back. And I actually think we may see one of those late career, best shape of my life, dominant kind of seasons, at least to start the year out of James Harden. I just have that feeling kind of in, in, in the back of my mind. It it seems like a, a situation that's ripe for. Um... To use use that extension or that use that option year to your to your benefit on both sides, right? I mean, look, it's a fake way to front load a contract when you just say, yeah. "All right, we're going to opt in and kind of think about that as part of the future guarantees," and and it allows you to really put more money against when you think he'll be better and, and less money against, and and it's more money sooner for Harden. I I think it's the best situation for all parties, and so I, I think I think you're right. I think we'll see something less than the max, but something that really tries to align the money more with his contributions. If that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, so I, I want to go across a couple bridges, same thing in the division, also turmoil with the Nets here. Um, obviously, the stuff about Kyrie has, has come out, and, um, you know, there's, there's mixed reporting on this subject. Maybe they want to – maybe Sean Marks isn't as uh, excited about giving him a long-term deal as he may have been earlier. 
Um, I'm I'm so curious to watch that play out because I feel like I think I tweeted about this. I feel like Sean Marks doesn't really have power in in this case, and and it's it's really going to come down to whatever ownership decides they want out of their franchise. Because if you're not giving Kyrie that money, I don't think they have meaningful pathways to contend, and, and Durant's probably going to want a, a way out. And if Durant Kyrie just go to ownership, be like, all right, we, we want to make this work, then I think ownership's going to sign off on this. But but curious if you feel like there's there's anything Sean Marks um, can really do about this. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot um, with you. I think the power there kind of lies on the player side, and I'll, I'll put KD and Kyrie together as a duo on that side, and then also with ownership. I mean, Joe Sai has come out now multiple times and said the Nets and the Barclays Center isn't making the money that he wants it to, right? And that's and that's publicly he has said that. So that's a that to me is a I don't know I don't want to sign up to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in tax bills, um, you know for at least the next you know four or five years. Um, so I, I still tend to believe what will probably ultimately happen is they'll all look around and if Kevin Durant even gives a whisper of, fine, don't do it. See you later. Get me out of here. I'll start asking for a trade every day. And we know Kevin Durant, he's not going to do it quietly either. He's going to go publicly and he'll take whatever fine comes with it. You know, he'll just say, I want traded. I mean, that's just where he is at this point in his career. I mean, this guy's outspoken nightly on Twitter. So he'll say what he wants. He's going to find I, his podcast and tweet about it. <laughs> right? um, I think, yeah, he's the most online person on the planet. Um, <laughs> I think what they're going to ultimately do is you'll you'll see Kyrie's not going to get the five year. They're going to align his deal with Kevin Durant's, where it'll be all right. You got your money, but it's a little shorter to to link up with Durant. We'll play this out over the next few years. Hopefully, get Simmons back on the court, yeah. and if we win enough, no one will care. It'll all be fine. Yeah. But I think that's what you're going to see. And I, I got to go back to too, kind of like I said about Zion. Very different situations, but I think because of all the other stuff we forget how good Kyrie is he's yeah. really really good like I mean his year this year he shouldn't have been getting all NBA votes that was nonsense Jalen but, Rose <laughs> yeah what are you doing um and I know he, he apologized for that um, but it's he was really good you know in the, those years but there's the injury history there with him too there's there's obviously a million other things you gotta worry about but yeah it's uh I'm very uh curious to see that one play out as well Let's um let's shift to the West. Couple of questions I think we have on that. Um, but the let's talk Lakers. Not just because we all have shared interest, but also but kind of because we all have shared interest. Because the Pelicans obviously have um, there's future draft considerations. They have more specifically next year they have the right to swap picks. Um, and and then there's obviously the, the 2024 pick that they can defer to 25 if they want. And so you know thinking about how this relates to their current season, they made a what I think is a great hire and head coach in, in Darvin Ham. That's a, I mean, a great first step that I think maybe not many people were expecting them to do. Um, but obviously the elephant in the room here is Russell Westbrook. And so, um, you know, do you have any sense of what you, how you think this might play out? Um, you know, there's been all these rumblings about Russ, you know, the ownership wanting Russ to, to be fit into the equation here. Um, any, any thoughts or feelings around how the Lakers situation might play out here next year? Yeah, I, I want to echo what you said about Darvin Ham. I think great hire. I, I think that that's 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 awesome. It almost kills me because I wanted him to get a chance. I just didn't want it to be there. But really hoping Mark we'll, Jackson. Really hoping that. <laughs> that's oh, right. Wow. We'll we'll root for the guy. You know to 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 you know do well in his opportunity there. Um, the rust stuff. I really felt like for months now, and I've been saying this on front office show, is it all kind of crumbled on them. It's over. Like you can't, you cannot run this back. You have to move him no matter what it takes. And you got to go. I think all the stuff that's been leaking out of there. I mean, and that, that, that is a leaky ship there um, in LA because everything gets out, which is what happens when you have 15 people in charge. So one of them's going to talk, but it's, we are now to a point where I think it's all the stuff of, Every coach is being asked, how are you going to make it work with Russ? And that's a big part of it. You got to make it work with Russ. I think that is a sign that they know there might not be anything out there that is reasonable. Um, they, they, it's hard because part of me says trade the picks or picks to get off his deal. 
if that's what you need to do. But there's nobody who can just straight absorb that deal this year. There's no team sitting out there with $70 million in cap space that can just burn half of it on one player. Um, so that's the that, that's a pretty big challenge. Um, there's clearly teams now that are – they wouldn't touch them no matter what you know was going on. Um, so it really is hard. But So I, I have now kind of flipped – think maybe he does come back and they they try to give it one more run and figure it out and that might be one of those where let's give it one more run and then when we're in december and the league trade market kind of opens up uh the middle of the month all right who who feels like you made a mistake this past summer you know how do we get off it now what do we do the next next? or it's made a mistake the next year probably (laughs) or are we in a spot where at that point it sucks. You're going to the bench. And then he's like, you know what? I'll give back 10 million. Just let me go and I'll move on. Um, you know, that's that, that might be the way to go. One thing that they cannot do. Um, I'll offer him free advice as painful as it may be. Do not wave and stretch him. You just, oh, work, you, you just <laughs> oh, worked God. off who all dings, uh, dead money. Don't, don't put 15 million a year in dead money. Oh my box. gosh. I'd be fine with it personally, but that's just me. <laughs> Keep keep doing that, Lakers. Okay, so last last um, West question before I before I have a, a personal question, we can wrap it up. That um, uh, so we we saw the Jazz and and, and Mavs kind of uh, play out a little bit. Um, the Jazz not having the season success they wanted. They perhaps don't all like each other in there, and um, I think it's. I'm not sure if there's been any clarity made on what Quinn Snyder's future is. Uh, with the jazz. So that's also a question mark. Uh, do you, do you, it, it seems like they've reached a boiling point and, and there's going to be some sort of shake up there. I'm curious to see what it is. I just can't find them finding like, like good value or good replacement value for, for Rudy, if that's who they end up moving. And I think if you end up moving Rudy with the idea that you're appeasing Donovan, I think that's a sinking ship uh, because Donovan can turn around easily and be like, couple of years down the line and still not want to be there. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, I think they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And, and one of the teams that comes up as a, as a trade partner for them is, is are the Mavs. Although Mark Stein, I think recently reported the Mavs might be interested in more of a Zach Levine type than, than a Rudy Gobert type, which I think absolutely makes sense. Um, the, the Rudy contract is very, very scary. And tying your future to that is, is tying your future to a very, very specific defensive team and with, with all the limitations that it comes with. Um, so just, uh, I just want to lob it to you with with those two teams. Um, we can start with the Jazz. Like, where, what what's your pulse on them? Yeah, I, I'm. The sense I'm getting is they're not going to split up Mitchell and Gobert, but everything around them is on the table. Um, we're hearing Mike Connolly. Maybe there are teams that are interested in maybe snagging him. Um, we're hearing a little bit about like Bogdanovich. You know, there might be a few teams as is his contracts coming closer to an end. Um, I think what you're going to see is they make some moves around now, those two guys run it back one more year and then let's see where it all goes. And I think we may see it's potentially, we could see Quinn Snyder do the very, very rare one year uh, extension. And it wouldn't it be a one year new um, contract now, as far as I guess we understand it. Um, and he comes back because I also related to that. I don't think Pop's going to retire yet. And unless it, I think Snyder might be the one who replaces Pop. Um, he, he came up under him. So unless Pop retires, and that's why we haven't heard anything on Snyder, and then he goes there uh, for next year, I think we might see, let's get one more run in with this jazz group. Um, let's see if we can re, uh, uh, you know, re- retool around Mitchell and Gobert and see. And then the next year after that, it might be, all right, we're, everything's got to go. And that's Mitchell, Gobert, the whole deal. We're tearing this thing all the way down to the studs. And we know Danny Angel do it. He has no sentimentality, does not care. He will tear it down um, and, and, you know, we rebuild it. It's, uh, you know, I, I feel more confident that he'll do that than he will go make trades to add to things um, now because I think he does get a little, you know, in love with what he what he's built at times. But I think we may see that. And then it, you may see it be where what Ainge does is, I tore it all down. We got a whole bunch of draft capital coming in, and now I've set up whoever his handpicked successor is to lead the organization. The the, the I think the the Spurs take is interesting. Um, do you 
Do you feel like, you know, whenever Pop decides to hang up, that's a super attractive job? I feel like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can see it both ways. I think they've got a really solid ownership structure in place, but I also feel like they're they're not in what you would consider like a premier market, you know? Yeah, I, and, I, and I think the further we get from them being a title contender year in, year out, the the less it it is that they're the model small market franchise um, that looks starts to look more like you had David Robinson and Tim Duncan for a 20 year window. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think it's just a little, a little different um, there. If it was today, I'd say, yeah, there's, that's an interesting young core. They've got a lot of really good players, uh, great flexibility moving forward. I would say, yeah, but if we're, you know, if pop hangs on for another year or two, then it starts to become a little bit more of a challenge of our, where are we looking to go um, as a franchise? Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, the my, Dallas side. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, the part of me says, don't be silly. You made it to the West finals. You don't need to do major big things. Um, go, you know, re- fix your big rotation, your forward rotation a little bit. Uh, whether it's Jalen Brunson or not, get another playmaker around Luca. Ease that burden, but it's got to be somebody who can ease the burden and also play off him too. Um, too often we try to get these guys who they're just not good off ball. And then, then that where, where we really run into the, your turn, my turn stuff. Um, but just don't be silly. It doesn't need to be, you know, yeah, you fell short, but no one expected you to be there anyway. You're ahead of schedule. You're a better team than it looks like. Just, you know, be, be reasonable about what you do moving forward. That's completely fair. So my my final question for the podcast uh, relates with your Orlando Magic. I'm interested in a particular particular upcoming restricted free agent, uh, Mo Bamba, and and I'm curious to what you feel like his market is and and what the, the approach Magic might take with him because you know I think I think there's been reporting around the subject. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Go, 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 Texas, right? No, um, you know, there's been reporting uh, around the subject where. They, you know, if they, they end up with Chet, then, um, you know, they, they might look to move off of him. Or even if they end up with one of the Jabari or, or Paulos of the world, then that's another big, quote unquote, that they're adding to the rotation. And and maybe uh, Mo's not going to be there for the long term future. So, um, yeah, where, where are you at on him and, and where do you feel like his market is? Yeah, uh, this is screams to me. Beware the contract year. Um, I, I'm nervous that somebody's I, I don't think someone's going to give him any you know ridiculous contract but i think even if he gets 10 to 12 million a season i think we could be two three years into that and people might be well there's 10 to 12 million sitting at the end of the bench not doing anything um and it turns into just a trade piece i i there were there was definitely improvement made from obama this year, he, he looked more engaged, more active, um, and like he was understanding things better. Um, that said, Wendell Carter's a better player right now, far better player. Um, I think Jabari Smith, Paulo Bancaro, Chet Holmgren, all better players day one than Obama will ever be. Um, I, if I was Orlando, I would, I would move on. I would wipe it away completely, renounce his rights, take all the cap space you can get, see what you can do with with that in the off season, uh, make it all try to work, you know, however you need to do that um, with, with your guys and just, you know, really lean into the, you know, kind of Carter Suggs draft pick group as kind of your foundation. It's let's see what you can do with Jonathan Isaac. Um, you know, I, it's, it is what it is um, with him <laughs> on and off the floor. Um, <laughs> I, I, That'll be a nothing. fun locker room to come back to for him. Yeah. He, Jonathan Isaac disappoints me in a lot of ways, basketball wise and non basketball wise. Let's just say that for somebody who was my favorite player in the league uh, in his rookie year, I, I loved the way he came in and the things he was able to do. Um, you've got Marco Fultz, you've got Cole Anthony, you've got a lot of young pieces. Uh, only Franz, right? Franz Wagner, um, my, my, my guy. Um, <laughs> that I love him. You know, he was he was the you know, one of the better rookies this year too. So I, I think you're in a position where move on from Bamba. You know, go get the draft pick. Use your cap space wisely and go. Because I just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm nervous about giving him any kind of major money. If yeah, if you could get him seven, eight million, done. You know, that's fine. That's always everybody can work around that. But you start getting north of ten, 
per year, you know, that's, that's tricky. I, I don't know. And, and you know what, maybe what's best for him too is go somewhere else and, and be on another team and see if, you know, that figures out even more. And maybe you're looking back and you say, man, we should have kept them. But if you nail the draft pick, you're not really going to care anyway. Yeah. I felt like with him, uh, he has the opportunity to be like a second draft guy where a different team, different role, different situation. Maybe yeah. he finds better footing. Um, before, before you brought up the, the whole like renouncing his qualifying offer thing, the, the, the value that kind of had pegged him at was, was um, MLE money, which is just the 10 that you're kind of uh, nervous about. Uh, but, you know, I, the, the way I approached that was like, okay, well, Rashawn Holmes um, is around 11, 12. Robert Williams is, is around 12, 13. Um, he's not those guys. And there's no way he's going to make more than that. Yeah. Um, and then the lower end was that was, was Daniel Tice was around, um, he's around eight, eight and a half or whatever. Yeah. I think he signed it was like 436 or 432, somewhere, somewhere around that. And I think Tice money is probably where you feel com- like really comfortable with him. But I think if, if he gets fully renounced that, that number, I mean, it just historically, like people who had their qualifying offer announced, they, they tend to go for a lot lower than, than their, their market value. If I was him too, I'd be, I would be very open to a one year deal with a good team. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, go to a really good team, see if you can pop, hit a better market next year. More teams should have cap space, and then you're you're in a position to maybe cash in that. Is his is what I think his qualifying offer is like just enough to where you I think have to offer him slightly more to to incentivize. But then you know if they manage to renounce him, that's just not even on the table. <laughs> yeah, their challenge is if they keep him, yeah. his cap hold is twenty two point seven million, and that yeah. takes them completely out of the running enough cap yeah. space. So that's yeah. your challenge is that cap hold is what you know kills your cap space dreams. Now cap space dreams may be too 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 much, right? Because we spending it on there's no yeah, but you know, they they're not be in the next dumping ground, right? right? Get some get some assets that's and it. yep, yeah. Yep, that's just, it. Yeah, just you know, shore you know, up your long term placeability yep, there. Just keep building, yeah. Cause they and you've got some extra picks coming from Chicago and Denver. Keep your flexibility clean, build around the kids. This is as odd as it sounds. The people I know that are true Magic fans, it's hard to find. The Orlando's no one's from here. Everybody moved here with the, with a team already. Um, but the people who are true Magic fans, they were more excited about this year's terrible, terrible team than they were me. Not the team that made the playoffs a few years ago, but the second team that made the playoffs in the bubble. Nobody cared. It was a big deal. We're just gonna get stomped out in the first round anyway. This year, people were so fired up. They 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 loved that young team. They liked that that group wants to be together. Um, and now you know it's it. There is actual real buzz about having the number one overall pick, and I think it's because they feel like no matter who we pick at the top of the draft, we're getting somebody who's going to be really really good, and and that's that's exciting. It's you know it's exciting to see people you know fired up about the team here. I think you could make that same argument for the most recent Pelicans playoff team. I'm obviously, once they got in and swept the Blazers, everyone was going nuts. But up into the playoffs, I mean, you lost Boogie uh, with, with the Achilles tear. And then, I mean, there was this, I don't think it was ever this type of, um, you know, passionate response to the team the way it was this year after the way they started to the way they ended up. So, uh, yeah, I think Pelicans fans can totally resonate with that. Yeah, there was just a sense of, all right. The first time making the playoffs was good because they hadn't for six years after Dwight and all that. So people were were excited about that. But even then it was, all right, we're going to play Toronto. They, it was almost the worst thing that could have happened was winning that first game against the Raptors because then people were like, wait, do we have a real chance? And I was like, eh, I don't think so. Um, and it turned out they didn't. And then that second year in the bubble, one, it was hard to get excited anyway because you couldn't even watch or go to the games um even despite the fact it was right down the street um but it was you know i think for people it was um you know it was just like ah, this team yeah we saw it they're great you made the playoffs again but where are you going and where are we going with the score when they started the tear down two seasons ago people were like all right i'm curious to see you know where this goes and now they're they're super attached to these kids they, they, they like these guys and that's fun yeah well, Keith, that's that's all we have. We have a quick uh, word to our sponsors, uh, DraftKings. The finals are right around the corner. Are you ready for a new NBA champ to be crowned? The official sports betting partner of the NBA, DraftKings Sportsbooks. Uh, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code BOOT as shown on your screen, B-O-O-T. Make any $5 bet during the NBA finals and get $150 in free bets instantly. That's promo code BOOT. Right there on your screen, only at DraftKings. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, 
Crisis counseling and referral services can be accessed by calling 1-800-GAMBLER. That is 1-800-426-2537. So thank you, DraftKings, and thank you, Pete, for uh, hanging out with us this uh, Monday morning. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah.